You're listening to the Ask Drone You podcast. You ask, we answer your drone questions. Whether you're here to turn your passion into profit or you simply fly for fun, we're a community of learners and teachers who aspire to achieve greatness. We are Drone You. Hey everyone, welcome to another fun episode of Ask Drone You. My name is Paul. My name is Rob. This is episode 737. We are glad you're with us. Hope you're having a great day. Interesting show today. Definitely interesting show. A couple of things we're going to be talking about today. Uh, we saw a couple of things come up in the uh, in the community that raised some eyebrows of concern, and we dug a little bit deeper into these uh, these issues and have found some very interesting things that we wanted to share with you, as we believe that um, some things may uh, not be legitimate. Is that a good way of putting it? Uh, yeah, um, I think that's probably <laughs> as good as any. So we don't have a question today though, right? No, we don't have a question. Today is more based on news in the industry, which there is quite a lot of. And one of the things I wanted to touch on, by the way, is I mentioned earlier this week that we talked about um, a guy who was posting about weekend classes with mapping. Um, his name was Wes, and he responded to my comment and it actually ended up being a very um, cordial conversation about expectations and assumptions. And he was pretty much saying that he's just surprised that more people don't you know, go to places like ESRI or a university to just learn the basics of photogrammetry and imagery as a whole and GIS and all that to have a much better understanding of drone mapping. Yeah, you know, and, and I think that's fair. My hunch, and I don't know this this gentleman from anybody, but um, I think sometimes this kind of conversation is simply based on perspectives. And what I mean by that is that there are so many different ways to learn now than there used to be. True. Right? It's just a different world. I'm not saying that this gentleman doesn't understand that. I just, again, it's perspectives. So somebody, again, as we mentioned in the show where we talked about this, Paul, it really comes uh, comes from where where is your passion and what are you most interested in doing? And so someone who's not interested in being a surveyor per se is not going to go to any of those schools and do the kind of thing that he's referring to. I mean, why would you? Maybe, maybe not. I mean, like what I said is, you know, I think that, like I said before, you know, I feel like drone mapping is to surveying as Airbnb is to the hotels. And a lot of people are just doing this purely for acquisition. They're not getting in it like you say, is as deep as that. Mm -hmm. So they're just trying to keep their scope very limited. Right. And and that doesn't mean they shouldn't have a really deep understanding of, of everything that it entails, but you don't have to go to one of those schools to do it. There's so many ways to learn. True. And, 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 I, and I'm not using that as a lead into a Drone U weekend class. <laughs> There's a lot of different ways to dig in via, via books and, and online courses and just so many different ways you can go about getting that kind of information. Yeah. Anyways. Um, in fact, he said, hey, Paul, thanks for the detailed comment. Glad you chimed in. My only point is the past several months of reading several of the different SUAS groups, no comment has been made that I've seen to encourage someone to take a course from someone in the GIS field or an institution. And that's fair. I mean, he's saying more information from geography and the geospatial arena. So let me look at this response. That's a pretty detailed response it back. It is. Yeah, which is great. Which I also great. got 18 upvotes. Look at this. Boom. Nice. I'm proud of that. Anyway, <laughs> um, today's show is based... I got zero. Uh, ...based on our friends at the Drone You community. If you want to have access to 27 courses for one low monthly price of $47 a month, you got to check out the Drone You, where it's not only a drone school, but it's also a drone community where people will build you up, help you out, and give you instantaneous answers to your questions. In fact, I saw a really interesting uh, post in the DroneU community today, and I wanted to mention it. Um, our friend Justin said he was reading the Rotor Drone magazine and saw an article on insurance discounts through the AMA with additional discounts through training programs. And he said the list noticeably excludes drone you from any test prep courses. So he posted a picture of it, and he says, is there a commercial drone insurance competitive 
with other drone insurance providers, which I find this is really, really interesting because instead of talking about how their insurance is actually competitive, they say this. They say, yes, AMA members are able to purchase the commercial drone insurance at a special low price. While there are many insurance providers, AMA's insurance may be the lowest price you'll find. Even with paying $75 to become an AMA member, AMA members can also get discounts on Part 107 test prep courses and flight training through these companies, Dart Drones, Fly Robotics, Gold Seal UAV Ground School, whoever the F that is, UAV experts and unmanned experts. Well, Rob, if you're charging four to five times what we charge, you're going to need a discount. (laughs) I'm just saying. I'm just saying to say, I mean... Um, anyway, I, I will say that, that our philosophy on, on how to price education is apparently quite different from all of those folks. I mean, I think we've done a video about that too. Probably. So, because education shouldn't be expensive when you're legitimately trying to help people out. So anyway, if you are looking to get help, we got it for you, the dronu.com. But let's move into today's story of the day. So an 11 year old boy was fined by the FAA for flying his drone on a beach in the early morning hours. Yeah, somewhere in North Carolina, which we've done shows on North Carolina. It's definitely not North Carolina, but we have done shows on North Carolina. So that's really weird because it says that. That's probably where it came from. That's interesting. The okay. address. The location is not important. Either way, <laughs> he got in trouble. Um, and this was, by the way, this was August of last year, which if you are privy to the regulatory environment, uh, John Taylor won his case in the early summer of 2017, nullifying the need for hobbyist registration of drones. And one of the eight provisions on the notice of proposed civil penalty showcase that the drone was not registered. See, look. Yep. And I find that interesting because... This was actually between the time of John Taylor winning his case and the Drone Defense Act didn't actually go into effect until December of last year. So there was like this six month time frame where you did not have to have a registered SUAS. And on the proposed penalty, they mention that his drone wasn't registered. Which, yeah, completely irrelevant. I find that very interesting. There, there. I mean, there are a couple of things in here that that um, they mentioned that are a problem, like flying over people. If that happened, right? Yes, yes. So, but it it's hard to take the entirety of this seriously when they add something like that that's completely irrelevant and misplaced. Well, here's something that's even more irrelevant. So this kid is 11 years old. How old do you have to be to have a Part 107 license? Uh, 16. I think it's 16 or 17. 15. I can't remember. It's no older than 16. We should know that. We should know that. <laughs> but uh, it's Thursday. So that's right. Anyway. Um, <laughs> and we're so far from 16. Whether it's 16 or 17, it doesn't matter because this boy is 11 years old. So they were saying in this proposed civil penalty that um, he was not, where is it? You did not hold an FAA issued airman certificate or a remote pilot certificate with an SUAS rating. Boy's <laughs> 11 years old. And he wasn't. And, and you don't have to have that to fly a drone. No, if you're doing it for a hobby, you don't have to have that at all. I mean, you could, you could be 40 years old and f- be right. flying for a hobby and, and not have that. Um, now, I just Why wanna, would they even put that in there? I think this is an emotional response from someone at FISDO. Somebody who, what, doesn't like seeing drones on the beach? I mean, there's, there's a vendetta here. I, yeah. Well, okay. So let's, uh, let's two, two things before we go into this. All of this information is based off of what we have been told. Well, so it could be wrong. Okay. I am reading off of the FAA's document. Yeah. Though. You're reading right from the notice <laughs> from the FAA to this but anyway, little boy and his dad. Yeah. But anyway, um, I, this is what we're being told. So it could be wrong. And my second point, okay, I'm just going to throw that out there. Okay. My second point <laughs> like a good is that dad, I son. have been, I'm not going to say victim, I have been the target 
of someone who was vindictive, who had been told a story about me that wasn't true. And, you know, this person came after me pretty aggressively, but then got to know me and we talked about everything and I showed him, you know, things that we were doing and all this and how we're trying to help out the community. And it totally shifted his mindset. So I'm wondering if this particular FISDO representative was told some heartfelt story from some crazy old lady who thought she was going to get a bob haircut that day and was like, he was flying six inches over my head. And like, you know, maybe he was, maybe he wasn't. I don't really know. Either way, though, either way, by the way, that's a different person. That is a different person. Um, (laughs) um, Either way, though, um, maybe the Fizzo guy took the story to heart from the upset woman. I know that there was an injunctive action against the woman from the little boy because she was so aggressive. So um, anyway, uh, either way, whether it was ill-conceived or not, there are a couple issues with this whole thing that kind of nullify a proposed civil penalty. And I find it fascinating because, you know, we talked about the whole Casey Neistat story Mm -hmm. and the FAA came out and said, we can't prove he's at the sticks, but like you can go to YouTube and it shows him on the sticks. So anyway, but they choose, and I know the FAA is a big organization, lots of people, and people make individual choices. I get that. There are a lot of really good people at the FAA. Earl, of course, you're my boy. Kevin Morris, you're the man. Um, Gary, thank you. Uh, John DeWitt, you're pretty cool too. There are a lot of cool people in the FAA, but there are some rogue mofos that do stuff like this that I think have to be cross-checked and questioned to make sure that the right thing is being done here. And that's all that we're trying to do. Yeah. Because this poor kid had saved up his money an entire summer to buy a DJI Spark, which if I was his dad, I would have got him a Mavic, but that's just me. Um, and <laughs> Side note. Anyway, <laughs> um, and the dad was an old you know, Tomcat pilot. He was a captain of a Tomcat. Pretty dang cool, okay? So that being said, the little boy looks up to his dad like, I want to be a pilot. I want to fly. Gets his spark, flies it after like the third or fourth time, and gets this piece of paperwork from the FAA. That is, yeah. Could I, you imagine if Jake got that? And Jake's older, but. Yeah, not too much older. Yeah, no, it would. <laughs> I don't even know what to say because of a couple of the things that are in here, particularly what you've, I mean, you've already called it out as far as the registration and the holding of the airman certificate. Neither are valid. Yeah. So, I mean, it essentially invalidates the entire thing. But now here's where, taking the FAA side, Here's where maybe they're trying to push a point here. It says uh, that, and I quote, during the flight, you operated the SUAS over persons present in the vicinity of blank blank. If he was flying really low and over people's heads and they have video proof of that, that could validate as to why this FISDO representative was you wrote this. And, and yeah, absolutely. But the other points still would not be valid to be on here. And there, I, when they say that, you operated the, the SUAS over persons present, obviously they're going to have to prove that. I mean, you can't just say that. True. So there's got to be their eyewitnesses, preferably video evidence. Well, yeah. and even with video evidence, depending on the angle that the video mm-hmm. was shot, you know, someone could be flying 100 feet away and it'd be made to look like they were flying right over somebody. Yeah. So absolutely, that is totally possible. But anyway, what's really shocking to me about this whole thing is that, you know, one thing I really like about the FAA is they have this compliance philosophy. So if someone gets in trouble, they pretty much bring him in the office. And it's scary. Like the first time you get a call or a certified letter from the FAA, you are shivering, shaking in your boots. I was. I'll be the first to admit it. Like I was scared. And I think as you should be, they can take away your license, your ability to make money and all that. And I mean, he's not making money, so that doesn't really count here. But it's scary when a federal agency says, hey, you're a bad boy. Mm -hmm. Come in here and let me spank that hand. Yeah, well, and pay up. 
Yeah. Show me the money. That's a lot of money. Well, it is a lot of money, but the, the so they're asking for twenty seven hundred dollars here, and they say it's a lot more, but they'll settle with that. But what it's really fascinating to me is that, and again, this is all that we're being told. They totally could have gone with the compliance philosophy, and the dad was like, "Go f yourself" or something, and had a poor reaction. Mm-hmm. So we don't know. True. We don't know. Yeah, we don't know the whole story. But the fact that this is all that we're seeing. And there's no compliance kind of philosophy going on here. It just has me worried. But it also makes me wonder if there's more to the story. So let me ask you this. Point eight. Let's read point eight. By reason of the above, so everything that we've already talked about, you fail to ensure that the small unmanned aircraft would pose no undue hazard to other people, other aircraft, or other property in the event of a loss of control of the aircraft for any reason. How does that relate, other than the hazard to other people because they're saying he flew over other people? Uh How can they possibly say other aircraft, other property in the event of a loss? Because it's part of the Part 107 law. Like, they say very specifically, like, you cannot fly recklessly or in a way that would cause undue hazard to people, property, or aircraft. No, I understand that. But what are they, are they suggesting that he flew in a hazardous way? I think that they are. Because he, caused, because he didn't have a 107 and because it wasn't registered? No, I think they're saying because if he was flying low over people, then he would say that they he failed to ensure that the aircraft would pose an undue hazard. Well, but it but, doesn't say he flew low over people. It says he operated the SUS over persons present. I mean, there's just, I just, that seems like a jump to me to make it sound that way in that final point. Well, I mean, if we go back to basics here, the child is 11 years old. 107 does not even apply to him because he is not eligible to even fly under those circumstances. But he can fly for hobby. Right. So kind of goes back to the whole beginning. Either way, I know that um, there is an article being written right now um, by the Forbes team about this whole thing. So you'll be hearing more about it. Mm. I'm excited to hear more about it. And I'm excited to see if this is the whole story or if not, because if this is the whole story, then I'm very disappointed in whoever, um, you know, proposed this penalty. Yeah. Um, because it doesn't really match with the FAA's compliance philosophy. Now, that being said, if it's not the whole story, it would make a lot more sense. Absolutely. So if there are more facts that we need to consider, then we look forward to hearing what those are. Yeah. Indeed. And we're not like most news channels and we're like, this 11-year-old boy was flying a drone and the federal regulators came in and shut him down. <laughs> and He's going to jail. We're just reading the letter. Yeah. This so. is what it says. And uh, appreciate this gentleman sharing it with us so that we could talk about it too. Yeah, we do appreciate that. So uh, we're not naming names or anything because... We uh, uh, intend on having him on the show to tell the whole story, uh, which hopefully will be soon. But we are headed to Denver next week for a LIDAR conference. Very excited about that. So anyway, um, if you have a question, go to askadroneu.com. Let us know how you feel about this particular issue. Leave us a, uh, leave us a comment on the, in the DroneU community or on our Facebook page. You can tweet us. Let us know what you think. But either way, that is going to do it for us today. My name is Paul. I'm Rob. This is Ask Drone You. (laughs) 